I personally use spice due to my anxieties and coping in prison. Not having a release date and things like that is quite um, hopeless. So I find myself using it to kind of cope. I've seen it ruin people's lives in terms of physically and mentally. It causes mass panic, mass anxiety, mass, I need it, I need it, I need it. It's a horrible drug, man, and it's, you know, I've never seen anything like it, you know what I mean? And, you know, they, they, they call it different names, but I, you know, they call it Mamba, Spice, K2, but for me, you know, it's the green crack, you know, because it is very highly addictive, do you know what I mean? When was the first time you had it? I see me mate from Chester Steel and he said, like, I've got a bit of spice here, mamba they call it. And then he's gone, he asked, try that behind your door. I only had four drags, there were seven of us in the pad. I've gone from now I am to like that within seconds. And I'd only had four drags. And then as soon as I got up in the morning, the first thing got me head, I've a mamba, I get a mamba, get the mamba, just, just after four drags. And they say every, your first drag could be your last. I first tried Spice when I was a while, and it was a new legal hype. There wasn't much hype around it. It was, oh, it's a two minute buzz. It's not gonna do much for you. And it's very much like cannabis. And I naively took some from a friend thinking, oh, it's just gonna be like cannabis. And it wiped me out. It absolutely took my head off. It made everything disappear. I didn't care. I didn't even know who I was. I couldn't tell you my name, I couldn't tell you anything before you know it. You're a two spliff a day man, and then you're a three, four, five spliff a day man, and then you're a 20 pound a day man, and then you're a, oops, addiction. I was sentenced to um, a life imprisonment in 96. Now I could have been out in 2008, but then I started smoking spice. You know, in the last four years, it's starting to grip, do you know what I mean? And it's really bad now, you know what I mean? I think, you know, my worst experience was, you know, I had once, I thought I was gonna die, you know, and, and that really scared me. But the madness of all that, you know, five minutes later, I was smoking again. So it didn't, it doesn't deter you, do you know what I mean? You know, even though it scares me, you know, and even it scares me when I smoke, because every time I put a spliff, you know, in my mouth, you know, I know, you know, I'm, I'm dicing with, you know, something serious could happen here, do you know what I mean? My worst experience was a week ago. I got a particular strand that was very powerful. Then I don't know what happened. Woke up in hospital. It's like being unconscious. You don't, you don't, you're not fully aware of what's happened until later on when you get feedback. Like they was gonna resuscitate me. I was gonna die. The people were fearful that I was gonna die. Um, and I didn't. I, I, it didn't scare me enough. I came back to prison, having got through it and recovered, and oh, I'm okay now. You know, back back to prison life, back to the grind and straight away used again. And went straight under again, went into a code blue again. Only this time there was a medical response. No hospital required as I hadn't taken as much as the previous time. Dragged off the floor and brought back out of it, yeah. I was rock bottom and I knew I was rock bottom, but that just spurred me on to use more. I jumped off a fence in prison off the exercise yard to get the spice I did. Broke 12 bones. And I still smoke it. It's daft, isn't it? 
I had four operations, done four months knocks, but oh, I'm still, still smoking it. I don't know what it is, I just can't, can't kick the addiction. You know what I mean? It's like eight years down the line now. And I hate smoking it. I, I just sit there with anyone, they'll give me it, and I'll be like, oh, I shouldn't have had that, I wish I never had it. But I just, I'm not strong enough in there actually to go, nah, get lost, I don't want it. Let's see if I have it. Nah. Don't think there's a way out. <laughs> yeah, in a coffin. I'll be honest with you, in a coffin, I think. I'm just stupid, I am. And addicted to it. There's never enough spice. There is never enough spice. Just like there's never enough heroin, there's never enough crap, there's never enough... There's never enough spice. I've previously experienced a, a, fear, a, a feeling of dread. What if the person who I usually go to doesn't have any this time? Who then has got some? What am I going to do if I don't have any and I've got to go behind my door, I've got to bang up, I've got to do eight hours behind my door? Rattling without anything, what am I going to do? And it brings like, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very stressful, panicky situation to be in. It involves a lot of emotional exhaustion. It involves a lot of physical exhaustion. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an obsession and addiction, yeah. It's like, you know, being a heroin addict, you know. I've rattled, you know, to no sleeping for two nights, sweating, jumping in a shower, you know, to fill that hole in my back, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I've, I've been there, I've done all that, but with spice, I have never ever seen a drug like it. I understand fear today, you know, what it's like to be scared, you know, because of, you know, I'm being bullied to do things that I don't want to do. But I know, you know, things are getting too much now. You know, I'm getting really uncomfortable, you know, with my associates, you know, things I'm doing, you know. I'll, ne I'll never be released, you know. I've been away 23 years now. For me to get out, you know, I have to change that but I can't see the change. I think it's, you know, making me depressed. Um, suicidal thoughts. If I carry on the way I'm going, you know, I could be dead this afternoon, you know. I've seen the best of men, yeah, just go to nothing, just straight down, getting it as if they've been stamped all over and then picked back up and said, get on with it. And they're just walking around like that, they can't do it. Anybody thinking about having it for the first time, what would you say to them? I wouldn't go near it, honestly, I wouldn't. It's just too addictive, emotionally and mentally. What do you say to anybody seeing this, thinking about trying it for the first time? I say think again, you know, because they're not, they don't know what they're getting into, you know what I mean? Because, you know, it's, it's you know, once you start, you know, it, it, it'll be, you know, it'll be hard to, you know what I mean, stop, do you know what I mean, because, you know, that, that's what it, addiction means, you know. What happens if Gary stays on it? Gary's going to be in prison for the rest of his life and probably, he'll probably keel over. And what happens if you get into recovery? I have a good chance of, you know, getting out of prison, might live longer, you know. And there's a lot of things that go through that, you know. You know, I'm fed up with spice. You know, I'm just sick of being sick. You know, I'm, I feel sick, man. You know, I've got butterflies, you know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable, man. I'm scared. You know, I'm, I'm searching every day. You know, how can I get off this? I think the help's out there. Yeah. And the change has to come from inside. Yeah. I need to be brave and say, look, you know, I'm scared. I need help. But, you know, till, till, you know, I be true to myself, you say, you know, enough's enough, um, which this is where it's leading to, you know, this is, you know, how I'm feeling today. So hopefully, you know, walking out of here today will give me that bit of confidence and say, do you know what, I've had enough. And hopefully, you know, I can come back in two years and say, do you know what, I've changed it. You know, I'm not that person I was two years ago. And that's my dream goal. I'm going to do it, man. I know I'm going to do it. You know, because, you know, not only, 
you know, am I doing it to get out of prison? I need to do it for my health and me in it. That's it. That's all that matters is me, nothing else. Today, I haven't used anything for three days now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. you put on that. Yeah. Every time I wake up and I want it, I remind myself of the times when I've looked at other people and seen other people running around and seen them after a few days and seen them after a week and thought, wow, well, he's all right. And he's doing all right now. Those guys are fine now, they don't touch it now. They're, they're sweet because they've got over the rattle and they've done it. So that kind of spurs me on to just go, one more day. Tony, we interviewed you in January. What's happened since? Just decided to sort my life out, you know. Um, I had a real bad scare. I ended up waking up in hospital. I can't give me the kind of kick up the arse I needed. Uh, I think I had to believe in myself in order to make things happen. Rather than looking at it as like a, a clinical aspect, like stop taking drugs, do it. But how do you do that if you don't believe you can? I deserve better for myself, I am worth it, you know. When was the last time you took some spice? So it was March, April, May, June. Coming up to, coming up to six now, yeah. Amazing, well done. I know, man. <laughs> it's been hard, it's been hard, trust me. So how would your room look? Back in January. Back in January? <laughs> wow, there wouldn't be anything in there. Anything. Empty, there would be no tubs, no, nothing to eat, nothing to drink, no sauce, no, probably not even the kettle, I'd have solved that. Food, um, shower gels, juice, clothes, trainers. Everything you see now, gone. Bare, bare minimum, whatever you're entitled to as a prisoner, that's it. Nothing else. There's no limit onto what it will take from you. It will take everything from you. When you stop, you get it all back. So rewarding though, getting it all back. What do I think is in spice? One, it's called fish food, you know, mm -hmm. cockroach pellets, you know, um, some sort of liquid, you know, detergents and all sorts, do you know what I mean? From what I've heard, they've got stuff like cockroach killer and rat poison and all kinds of stuff in it. It's impossible to know exactly what's in it because the batch changes all the time, so it's made up of different ingredients. Alley wheel cleaner, cockroach killer. Pff, I don't know what from that like. I imagine that if it kills cockroaches, it can't be any good for us. Having, knowing that they, cockroaches can survive nuclear fallouts.
spice is a blanket term um, which is used to describe a lot of different products which contain a, a chemical which is known as a synthetic cannabinoid. And these are compounds which mimic the effects of cannabis um, and they hit the same parts of the brain that cannabis does to produce the similar effects. These chemicals are manufactured in the laboratory. They actually are quite complicated to synthesize and produce. You need a high level of technical expertise. There's probably about 400 to 500 different synthetic cannabinoids known um, in, uh, to science. And the, uh, the actual makeup of those, of those spice products can vary significantly because there's potentially a wide range of different chemicals that can be put in but also the potency can vary significantly. So the concentration of the, of the substances and that can lead to a very, very dangerous, almost Russian roulette scenario where individuals just don't know what potentially they're taking and how strong the substance is. What I can say is that there's very little research on these drugs. They were tested, as they, all drugs are tested, in normal volunteers to see if they're safe. And they weren't. There's so little knowledge of them. They could be affecting hundreds of, of our chemical systems in the brain. So what we're looking at here is an MRI scan of a brain. So this is a slice through the head. So we're looking down from the top. This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. And the yellow and red areas are areas where there's increased activity in the brain. Uh, following the drug. Now in this case this drug is skunk so we haven't been able to do synthetic cannabinoids and probably never will because we don't know if they're safe to give to humans. So this is the, probably the best we can get and here you see there's this very m massive activation in the back of the brain here. This is why they see hallucinations, this is why they go into this strange state of dissociation this is perhaps where they start hearing things. And then here in the front, you see this, the front of the brain is also overactivated. And that explains why they get anxiety and maybe why they get seizures. One of the most horrifying and remarkable and unexpected effects of these new forms of spice is that people go into what they call a zombie state. It switches off their consciousness completely. Uh, and so they actually don't know who they are, they don't know where they are. Sometimes they can't even stand. Other times they go stiff. We call it catatonia. And in a sense, their, their body gets so overwhelmed that they it can't work and they either get locked, they either collapse or they get locked into this situation. So we think it's probably something to do with the dopamine system in the brain. As you turn on dopamine more and more, eventually you get to a state where there's too much dopamine and you're either manic or you're paranoid because dopamine drives paranoid thinking. But all they seem to do is disrupt brain function extraordinarily. That the impact on the brain is so powerful that people don't remember what's happened. It's like a state of extraordinary intoxication when people are so drunk they don't remember committing crimes or having fights, etc. Spice um, is usually found in prisons in two different forms. The first form is uh, a form that's very similar to what we see on the street, which is a smoking blend. So this is when the chemical has been basically mixed with an inert vegetable matter, and then it's dried out, and then it's just rolled up with tobacco and smoked as you would with a, a joint. The other form of spice is what we call spice paper. So this is when um, a piece of A4 sheet or something like that has been impregnated with the chemical and then uh, it is uh, then cut up into credit card sized um, uh, portions which are then sold for significant profits within the, in the prisons. Normally the concentration which is shown by the orange colour on this sheet here would be uniform across an entire sheet of paper and that unfortunately is not the case. What we have seen is that 
the concentration of the active drug can potentially vary across the paper. So it means that if potentially each of those squares or those credit card sizes has a different concentration of the drug and therefore potentially could be more harmful if it's potentially a much more higher concentration. It's very clear that um, people become dependent or addicted to spice. When people go catatonic on spice, they're affecting the dopamine system. The dopamine system is also strongly implicated in, for instance, addiction to things like crack and crystal. And the brain doesn't like to be in a state of such a disruption. So that when you stop using it, you go into withdrawal. And the potency of spice means that the receptors are very powerfully changed, so you get very powerful withdrawal. And you know, people have said it it's, looks just like heroin withdrawal. You get so many physical symptoms as well as the psychological symptoms. It's almost like playing Russian roulette. Every product, potentially, there are over 400 different examples that are known, and potentially a bag or a batch of spice can contain any of those 400 substances. So what you thought you might have done, got one, one in one batch, and what you get in the second batch may be completely different in terms of which chemical is present, but also how strong it is. So this variation of both the chemical makeup and also the potency is really a very dangerous and risky game to be played. They might actually have long-term consequences. So even if you get over the, uh, and you survive the initial uh, intoxication and, and, and this sense of the dissociation and cat catatonia, it may end up damaging your brain so that you never fully recover. If you can avoid taking spice, definitely avoid taking spice because it's very difficult. It's impossible. No, it's, not difficult. it's impossible to know what you're taking and what effect it might have. I only heard the spice when I came into prison on this sentence and I, I'd seen, seen what it did to people and I thought, well, okay, I'll have a go, you know. I, I, I did like it at first, but as time went on, I, I, I grew to hate it. I started to get a bit worried because it, what it did to me, it enhances your fears, it enhances your worries and that was worrying for me in itself, you know. It made me a lot more paranoid, literally holding onto my, my, my table in my room, absolutely paranoid, scared like that. And I couldn't move, and I, I, and, and I was just totally in fear. You know, I was in fear. I thought my heart was pounding like I've never heard it pound before, you know. And I thought, this is it, this is it. This is my life over now, you know. I thought it was going to die. It gets you, gets you to that point where it controls you then. And that's frightening. You feel scared uh, because you think, my brain needs this, my brain needs this to survive. I was totally addicted to spice. I had three and a half years where I, where I, 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 I was like that. I ended up being in debt because of it. 
what made me sort it out was with two or three men on my door. Yo! Hey! If you keep me on the door then... Where's my stuff? Where's my stuff? Where, where's what you owe me? Yo, who's the fucking man up then? Yo, tell him man, tell him, tell Yo, him. Yo, you think you ain't gonna, you gonna stay in the front of the table? You know, and, I, and, I, and I, I was literally, literally sitting on the toilet trying to hide from the door. What? what? You coming now, Black? Black, I'm gonna get you, Black. No matter what when you go to, I'll get you, Black. Think I'm gonna dick it out of you, Black. I can't be dealing with this every time, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's something that's got to give. You know, I, I, decided, I decided I couldn't carry on like this. And something did give for me, which I'm grateful for, you know. That give was a, a letter from Berlin. Except say if you want to come, if you have a choice to come to Berlin. And I made that my turning point where I stopped it. I thought, stop smoking, stop stop taking drugs, complete new change. I left that life behind me when I when I left my last prison and I, I chose this as a new as as, as as a real big turning point and, and, and a and a way forward and I'm glad I did. I really am glad I did. It was hard. I mean, there have been, been hurdles along the way, but I just, I had so much of a desire to change that that has helped me get through to, to where I am now. Bear with his help by giving me a lot of help. Uh, a lot of advice and a lot of encouragement and ways and means of filling my time positively rather than negatively. I, I, I take the positives from it. Like now, I have my canteen's my own. What I, what I, what I order is for me, not for somebody else. This is what I use for me cooking all my spices and that. And that. And that. I'll be cooking a, ma a mackerel curry tonight, you know, so, yeah. I, I now don't have any worry about who am I going to pay, where, what, you know, who, who's going to attack me because I haven't paid. I have, I've eliminated all of that, so it's made my jail sentence a lot easier. Come the 8th of March, one year. One year. I feel a lot better for it, a lot healthier, and I now have got a, a more positive outlook on life. How is your life now, mate? In all honesty, yeah. I've swapped one spice for another spice. What's the other spice? The other spice is the cooking spice. I like me cooking now. I, I, all the things that I couldn't do before when I was in debt. So, you know, I'm slowly, slowly learning to cook like I've never cooked before. How's it taste, John? So now I, 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 I enjoy the positive spices. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning that there's going to be a whole new world out there when I get out. You know, a whole new lot of different things that I can do, you know. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. I know I'm going to have a, a better chance of carrying on on the outside and I hope that someone somewhere out there seeing this takes positivity from it. So anybody watching this in the prison or this prison who is going through now what you went through that you're not totally addicted to it, hating it, what do you say to them? 
make the change, take the plunge. But it's got to come from in there. It's got to really come from in there, otherwise you'll not succeed. You know, it, the, the want and the desire has got to be there. And put that, put that into your body. Put that, instead of putting the drug into your body, put the want and the desire to be a clean, drug-free person and you'll succeed. I've come to the point now where I realise it's, it's only going to keep getting me into trouble. I think there's a couple of ways you should get help. You can either speak to an officer and say, listen, I'm, I'm struggling, I want to get off spice and I, is, is there any help available for me? And they will direct them to the peer support groups, uh, mental health, uh, healthcare in, in here is very good. They, they have a substance misuse team who are very good and they will help them and point them in the right direction. You know, so they, there is help, plenty of help available for all people. Did you ever think you'd get clean? I never did, no. I never thought I would. I've been on it for 35 years now, and the last day that I, I got under the door changed my life. It turned it around, and I know, given the chance, there will be other people that would be the same. So it was a big boost for me, and as I say, I'm now 18 months into that, and I'm really doing well. I've got a really good chance of coming around to the before Christmas now. What will you do if you don't get it? Uh, well, I, I want to give something back to the prison. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some voluntary work in the community and on, on, on substance misuse. I think what I've learned whilst I was in Bering was brilliant um, and, and I think passing it on to somebody else with a bit of knowledge, hopefully it will stop them from going to prison. You know, so. Yeah, give them something back to the community from what I, from what I talk, you know, that, 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 that's my main goal. What's the future look like out there? Pretty bright for me, a lot better than I, 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 I thought it would be when I first came in. But no, yeah, it's going to look a rosy at the moment. And what are you going to do when you get out? Stay drug free. There's never enough spice. There is never enough spice. It causes mass panic, mass anxiety, mass. I need it, I need it, I need it. It gets you, gets you to that point where it controls you then. And that's right, when, you know, when you're, not, you're, not, you're not in control anymore. I've seen the best of men just go to nothing just straight down, getting it as if they'd been stamped all over and then picked back up and said, get on with it. But with Spice, I have never ever seen a drug like it. It's the green crack. I can't win. It's just too addictive. Emotionally and mentally. Madness, eh? It's become a phenomenon, hasn't it, within prisons. I don't... I don't think anybody could have predicted that it was going to make its way into prisons in the way that it has done. I see people who are quite stable, someone you can work with, and suddenly they will go from you know, turning up to appointments to not coming out from behind their doors because they've got like involved in the whole sort of circle of spice. 
and debt and, and problems in prison. Which spice. I think it's got a big impact on their mental health. A lot of the men do degrade quite quickly off of it. You can see it physically in, in their actions around and the way they speak, it affects them quite badly. Physical health, you notice they lose a lot of weight, they get a bit more gaunt and skinny. Uh, they sort of act a bit more as if they're frail, more elderly almost. You can tell that it's affecting them. People's family lives break down because if you're zombified off spice all the time, you can't maintain a relationship with your mother, with your children, with your girlfriend. It, it doesn't go hand in hand with that healthy relationship, really. You get debt issues with the people that they're getting it off, uh, could eventually end up getting bullied into trying a, a, new batch, a new batch of it and like testing it. You know, they'll get themselves into trouble, they'll get nickings or they'll get adjudications, which could add added days onto them prolong their sentence it means the longer they are away from their family and everything and then you've also got to think about the repercussions that it's having on their family as well. The effects that we see um, from families is that they lose their son even though he's still alive and he's, he's walking and functioning they've lost him because of spice. Oh, it must be devastating. It must be devastating. They start ruining relationships in the prison, they start ru ruining relationships outside of the prison so they're left kind of like with just this themselves, the drug, the problem and the people who supply it. So you, you find yourself at the bottom really quickly with nothing. It affects everybody. It just brings so much more trouble to our job. It makes our job so much more difficult. It takes you away from helping other, other men that aren't on Spice because you're having to deal with all the fallout from a Spice attack or having to move somebody to another wing because they're on, in debt. It's something that we don't necessarily come to the job to deal with. You know, we come here to help these people, try to stop them from coming back into prison, rehabilitate them, but you know, then we've got to deal with that on top of it as well whilst we're, all, whilst we're trying to rehabilitate them. Spice can affect my work in day quite quite dramatically because if someone's under the influence we then have to take time of our, out of our day to deal with that person. We have, I could be helping people, other men on the wing that need it with like personal issues. It's a strain on relationships when we're trying to build positive relationships with the men uh, in an effort to get them through their sentence. Okay, so we could get to a point that we come down heavy handed on everyone and we say we, we drug test everyone here. If you've got it in your system, this is what's going to happen. We'll send you back to court, you'll get another six months, six months, six months. But these people aren't deterred by stuff like that because they're addicted, they're in debt. It's their way of trying to get away from some reality or something. So you can't keep punishing people. You've got to get to a point and say, this can't be about punishment. It's about rehabilitation, it's about support. I don't know what it is because you can't. Can't kick the addiction. You know what I mean? It's like eight years down the line now. And I hate smoking it. But I just, I'm not strong enough in there actually to go, nah, get lost, I don't want it. I see if I have it. Nah. Don't think there's a way out. <laughs> yeah, in a coffin. I'll be honest with you, in a coffin, I think. I'm just stupid, I am. And addicted to it. If they come to us and say, look, I've really got a problem, I'm struggling here, that's where we need to pick it up before they're going out and say, what can we do to help you? Whether it's through medical intervention or whether it's through substance misuse and community intervention on the outside. I first tried Spice when I was a while and it absolutely took my head off. Before you know it, you're a two spliff a day man and then you're a three, four, five spliff a day man and then you're a 20 pound a day man and then you're a Oops, addiction. I was totally addicted to spice. It enhances your fears. It made me a lot more paranoid. My heart was pounding like I'd never heard it pound before, you know. And I thought, this is it, this is it. This is my life over now, you know. I thought I was going to die. It's like being a heroin addict. I think it's, you know, making me depressed. Suicidal thoughts, if I carry on the way I'm going, you know, I could be dead this afternoon. I'm searching every day. You know, how can I get off this? Yeah, you ask them why and they just, they just don't know. 
they're just stuck in that that circle where they just keep going round and round and round and it's just yeah. until you find that key motive on why they're doing it and then you can focus on that then and giving the right support groups and hope that they come out of it. But the support in Berwyn is, the support is there. Um, there's a lot of support groups and the healthcare support. It's got to be led by the people that are using it, it's got to be by the people that are taking it. Whether it's through substance misuse services, whether it's through the key worker, whoever it's through, we've got to try and stop that demand. But you've got to stop the demand in the first place. You stop the demand, there's no need for supply. And that's very difficult to do. We've got to keep working at it and try and help the people that are users, addicts, um, and even those that are supplying it. Like for me, I've had dealings with, with a lad that had made the decision that he wanted to come off it and that he'd, he'd started that process of where he was, say, a couple of weeks in of not using. I myself have asked for help in many different directions and just to be able to say, I need help. I don't know what help I need, but I need help. Could somebody help me? I think the staff are desperate to help people. And then he came onto my community and I was giving him his, I was given as a key worker um, and then we just, I'd, I'd sit down and talk with him weekly and i just, i give him the open policy that, look, if you are thinking of using, you know, come and speak to me about it. Or if you have used, like, come and speak to me about it and we can see why you've used and see the reasons behind that and then make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. Just because someone gets addicted to something or uses something and creates an issue, it's wrong to then say, I can't keep doing this, I can't keep doing it. We know that's what our job is. And our primary thing is around the safety of the individual. We can't give up on them. We've got to keep helping them, we've got to keep supporting them. Because for me, it, it's all about support with them. Because um, they just, a lot of the time, they just need somebody there just to reassure them, no, you are doing well. Um, because they, they haven't got that confidence and they haven't had that support before in the past. in order to make things happen rather than looking at it as like a, a clinical aspect like you stop taking drugs do it, do it. how do you do that if you don't believe you can I deserve better for myself I am worth it you know when was the last time you took some spice February, March, April, May, June coming up to coming up to six now yeah amazing well done I know man it's been hard it's been hard trust me there's no limit onto what it will take from you it will take everything from you when you stop you get it all back so rewarding though getting all back. How's he doing? Alright, yeah, he's doing well. Yeah. Um, he's in contact with his brother and that and he's now starting to rebuild the trust with his family now that he's he's got a level head on and everything and he's starting to speak to his family again and trying to find out where his mum is, who he lost contact with, and he's thinking about all the right things now and making sure he's doing the correct courses to help himself when he gets out. Berwyn doesn't give up on people though, right? No, stick at it. Yeah, it's one of ours. Yeah, it's all about resilience. Stick at it, stick at it. We don't give up on anyone, absolutely. Do you remember the first time you took it? The first first time you took spice? It was it was uh, in HMP Hill, and uh, we was around a group of 
friends, they had a lot of it and uh, I'd never smoked it before. Someone passed me a joint and I'd smoked it and they was like all laughing. It was like that's, and, and then I found out it was spicy and I went all oh, weird. I'm on top of addict, I'm like, I'm like, it's like the Pringles effect. Once I pop, I can't stop. So I have that first one and uh, that's it. Here's a, a bad day for spice. Asking someone for their ashtray who smokes spice because you've got nothing but you've got a habit. And you're like, can I have your ashtray? So I can get your dimps out of the ashtray and make a roll up with, it's still got a bit of spice in and you're smoking it. And that's how I used to start a lot of days when I didn't have nothing. And then selling all your stuff, your clothes. Yeah, I'm at 50 pound, 12 pence. Ringing your family, dad. Yeah. It's the same sort code and account number as last time. You still got it? He knew it was bad when I was just saying to him, Dad, have you got a pen and paper? He's like, I, I don't need a pen and because he knew what would be coming next. I'd be like, Dad, write this sort code and account number down. I need you to put £25 in that account. I said, how long are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Putting pressure, bad pressure on him. And my dad's got, I had a bad heart. And I feel really guilty now about what the pressure, because this weren't, this was on a daily basis. He used to get his pension and I'd be, pressure, I'd be asking him to put money in my account. And it's not a good thing. That was bad. Yeah, that was a bad time for me on Spice. Love you, Dad. Love you. Bye, mate. The worst I can remember, I sat down the block, HMP Hill, and I had a lot of it. I mean, a lot of it. And I was smoking it. And uh, I, could, I hallucinated that I could see my dad outside the window, and I actually watched him getting beat to death. I, I was screaming out the window, Dad, Dad, run, they're coming after you, they're coming after you. I was standing myself, naked, out of my head, putting the belt on, saying, boss, they're gonna kill him, they're gonna kill him. I, I was crying my eyes out, because I'd smoked that much, I'd smoked myself into like, a stupor. Honestly, you couldn't convince me that that wasn't real. I watched him physically get kicked to death. And I was, nothing I could do, I was beyond the bars. And that was a horrific time for me. So, what changed? For me? Did you get a rock bomb? <sighs> Did you have a rock bomb? Uh, yeah, sitting in the block, wanting to hang myself, basically, if I'm honest. I had low self-esteem. I didn't feel very good about myself. Uh, and, quite, and I was making poor decisions, basically. I made some poor choices. I was, I was on suicide watch, and uh, I, I just didn't see a future to my life. I just wanted to die, basically. Do you know what it was that made me switch? I was in uh, Birmingham prison, and uh, I never thought addicts could get clean and live a successful life, because everyone I've seen, I've either been on methadone scripts for 20 years or died. Prison, death, or or in a, sat in a council flat, being on a me, picking up a big bottle of methadone every day. That's all I've seen in my area. So anyway, I, I, sit, I attended an NA meeting, and as the weeks went by, I got to know them. These are bit, some people who have been addicted for 20, 30 years on heroin, been at rock bottom. They turned their lives around, and now there were successful people coming into prisons, teaching people about it. And that, for me, that that I know for a fact changed me. Because since then, I've just been a different person. And it sort of gave me hope. And sometimes when you've got no hope, and you think, whoa, what's the point? No one changes anyway. So when I can actually see with my own eyes that someone, people do change, that, that, that yeah, like, again, it was an epiphany moment. I wake up, a light bulb moment. Jesus, Greg, this, can be, this is possible. I got, I got moved to prisons to Stoke Heath, and uh, I stayed completely clean since then, basically. Yeah, it's difficult because, uh, especially when you've got a group of friends around you, that's probably the hardest bit to do, you know, to step away from that group of friends. Because some, I've, I've had to go through like months of like, basically having no friends. Like Christmas Day 2016, everyone was smoking spice. I just sat in the cell watching Home Alone. I felt a bit sad, but to be fair, but it was my first Christmas clean. I got through that. Then I got through last year, and then again this Christmas, like, I just sat in the cell watching like Christmas films, and I thought, God, God, you're getting a bit sad now, but 
do you know what? I got through it. If people have had enough, they've hit the pain threshold, don't want to do that anymore, don't want to smile on, how do they sort it out? They need to get support in prison. I'd speak to your SMS worker uh, and definitely start attending groups because then uh, what you can do is you can get people who are like-minded, motivated and committed and driven to stay substance free. You get a few ideas off them and uh, then you can be there to support each other. That's how it worked for me anyway. And uh, yeah, the support's out there. You've just got to get it. If you want it, but th this is what it boils down to. It's difficult. I ain't going to lie. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. It's difficult. Recovery is difficult. You've got to want recovery. You've got to really want it, do you know what I mean? So yeah, if you want it, and you'll know when, you, when the time's right, you get the, the support, so the support's there, all you've got to do is access it. The staff here are good, really good. Berwyn's helped change my life around, if I'm honest. Berwyn has been a massive help for me. I can stand there and look you in the eye and say, Berwyn has helped change my life. They want to support you here. They actually want you to change. Whereas in other prisons, it's more to do with punishment than it is rehabilitation. What could people do instead of smoke spice? Well, there's loads of things you could do. There's like loads of groups, courses. Me personally, I go to the gym. I enjoy going to the gym a lot. There's loads of stuff to take advantage of. You just got to want to do it, basically. What people could do instead of spice, they could set goals. Like this is what, I'm, what I do. I set goals, short term, long term, and uh, I, I work to achieve these goals. And then when I achieve them, it's like I feel good about myself. Greg, spice, cut. Nice. Brilliant. Excellent. How was that? That was brilliant. That was. When we're doing the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I liked it. Cold blue, this is an emergency. A knife to the spleen has caused paralysis. Its emergence was the start of an epidemic. Common side effects include psychosis of the heart and cardiac arrest of the brain. Many who have encountered this predator fall victim to its will. It's prolific in its quest and its quest is to kill. Cold blue, this is an emergency. Call the paramedics, but call it what you like, because names are irrelevant. The importance is behind why so many roll dice with life just for a high. Cold blue, this is an emergency. Call the paramedics, do you understand? This is an emergency. The results could be catastrophic. You could end up cataleptic just for a high. If you died, what should I say to your daughter, son, partner or mum? That you died for a high, that you're dead for fun. Cold blue, this is an emergency. Call the paramedics. But is that what you want? A cold blue, culminating in death or a life-saving surgery? Is this your goal?
Cold blue, this is an emergency, but don't call for paramedics, pay attention, because this is an emergency. Spice ruins more lives than just the one it takes. In some situations, prevention is the only cure. There's a reason some people are celibate. It's not for a high, and it's not for the hell of it. Cold blue, this is an emergency.